Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily COVID-19 global show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. It is my honor to convene this daily conversation that takes place with friends and family and colleagues and enemies around the world. And we are so grateful to everyone who has supported us these 106 days. That's right, 106 episodes in 106 days. It's hard to believe that we've pulled that off and we've done that because we want to understand three crises taking place in America today. The health crisis, the economic crisis, and the racial inequality crisis. Tonight, we have a very special episode focused on US immigration issues. The Trump administration has new rules that are dramatically changing US immigration law. Two leading experts help us understand the state of play. We'll be joined by Prashanti Reddy, an immigration attorney. She's at readyesq.com. And Cyrus Mehta, another immigration attorney at cyrusmehta.com. He's also on Twitter, at Cyrus Mehta. Make sure that you are connecting to them, follow them, and please prep your questions. We'll be coming to them in just a couple of minutes. They also have time to share this with their friends and family around the world. Thank you all. I'm Sri, and I'm so grateful to my wonderful producers, Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon on Twitter, and Rose Horowitz, at Rose Horowitz 31 on Twitter, for helping me put together this show. We're live right now on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. You have friends who are interested in this topic, so please have them connect with us by going onto those platforms and tagging your friends there, or just hit retweet. Make sure that your friends join us. We want to hear your questions, your comments, to understand the state of US immigration. So much is changing. Before we bring on our guests, we have to thank our sponsors, and also tell you a little bit more about the show because I know some of you haven't joined us in a while. This is our 106th show, but at the 100th show, we did a little tabulation that in our first 100 shows, we had 201 guests from a dozen countries and 45 cities. 124 of them were women. We're very proud of that number. We've had doctors, lawyers, engineers, CEOs, teachers, professors, nurses, and all of that is possible because of our partnership with Scroll.in. It's one of India's best news and analysis and culture -like coverage websites. Please check them out at Scroll.in. We're gonna get started in just a minute. And before we bring on our guests, we want to thank our sponsors. First, we wanna thank Art & Co. Get involved with the world's largest online art auction, Fundraising for COVID-19 Victims, artandco.net, artandco.net. We're also grateful to Rutgers and the Global Entrepreneurship Experience, a virtual teen camp. Please go in and check them out at globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org. Teenagers anywhere in the world can participate. You get a 20% off with the code SREE. -E. Please take a photo or please share this. There are fantastic speakers from Cognizant, Google, Facebook, Angie's List, and there's one terrible speaker, me. Your team can skip my session for sure. But please tell them about the conference, the team camp that's being put together. We also want to thank our friends at Muckrack for making this free course available. They made it possible for me and my team to put together a free course for you, a free certification course on fundamentals of social media for anyone from any background, any age, go to mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social, and there you will be able to sign up. More than 4,000 people have already signed up for the course, and we love seeing the certificates as people post them. Here's Lauren Mack's certificate. We love seeing that. Another thing that you can add onto your LinkedIn. We also want to, before we bring on our guest, tell you about an exciting new show on episode number three, and that's She's On Call. Two New York City surgeons, Dr. Sujanas Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Kurian, friends of mine, and I are executive producing this amazing show, She's On Call. This is last week's show that you can find 
on at She's On Call on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. Please follow them. Last week, we had Dr. Nadia Hernandez and Dr. Lilun Lee. Dr. Lee wrote this very important Washington Post story about how rubber bullets actually work. Did you know that there's a metal core inside rubber bullets? Well, she told us about all of that on the show. So please check out She's On Call on Facebook, and it'll be live this, uh, this Sunday, 11 to noon. That's talking to doctors. Today, we're talking to lawyers. So let's get ready. We want to talk about the what's happening with U.S. immigration law, and we want your questions and your comments. Tell us where you're watching from. Please type it into the platform that you're on so that we can do a global tour of all the comments and all the questions. But right now, let me bring on to stay onto the stage our friends Prashanti Reddy. Hello, how are you? Hi, 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 Sri. Great to see you. And Cyrus Mehta. Hi, Cyrus. Hello, everybody. Hi, Cyrus. Hi. <laughs> Of course, you two know each other. We're great. Uh, we're grateful to both of you for joining us on a Thursday. I presume after a long set of Zoom calls all day that you're on, and then you're here. Let me ask each of you the question I ask all our guests: How are you? How's your family doing through this crisis? We'll start with Prashanti. Uh, we're doing well, thank you. Um, just went into the office today. It was rather strange to be in the office after three months, but. Um, yeah, and uh, hoping that things will get better. And But otherwise, my son, he's 12 years old, and he's busy with his Zoom classes. But I think it's going to be the end of school tomorrow. So we'll have to see how to keep him entertained uh, over the summer. But otherwise, we're having fun. We're cooking together, watching shows. And I think, you know, it's, it's good to um, make use of this time um, because I don't think, hopefully, it won't come again in this way. But I think that's a silver lining, you know, spending time with family. I, I completely agree. Let's go to Cyrus. Cyrus, how, how are you and how's your family? Uh, we're doing uh, very well. Thank you very much. And like Prashanti, we're working mostly from home. But we have also, I have also been going to the office during the entire lockdown period to provide essential services because... Um, the immigration service still requires paper-based applications to be filed. And so uh, a few of us have been going into the office to collect mail, look at deadlines, and even file voluminous paper-based uh, applications, which we find very difficult to do from a home-based uh, printer. So I have actually been venturing um, into the subway throughout the period, and um, we've been designated as essential workers by New York State to uh, perform essential services for clients in the immigration law field. So that's why you were able to get, get to, you're able to get there. So thank you very much. Uh, there's so many changes going on right now. And uh, there is so much, so many questions people are asking, changes to the, these visa categories that many people who are watching the show right now know H1B, L1, and J1 and all of these visa categories. So let me start with Prashanti to kind of explain what's happening. And I'll ask uh, some questions of both you and Cyrus. So go ahead, uh, uh, Prashanti, we'll start with you. Just explain what has happened in just the last few days that is important for people to follow. Right, so as I think everyone has been extremely anxious, the last one month, I think, trying, try, trying to figure out you know, what's gonna happen and who's going to be affected and what, um, Trump's next executive order is going to say. And so finally, it's at, it's out and it's as bad as we thought it would be. Uh, so uh, the executive order um, is effective from, uh, it was effective from June 24th, 12 a.m. And basically what they're saying is um, that all L's, uh, H's, so H1B visas, L1 visas, all L visas and the J visas, so pretty much, you know, most of the work visas that we have right now, that if they're out of the country and they don't presently have a valid visa, uh, then they cannot come in until December 31st of this year. Um, so that's what uh, it is right now. That's what's happening right now. And so what does that mean? So just explain to someone who's watching, who has, they'll know their own status, of course, but somebody who's watching who has a friend or family member who is on an immigrant visa, they're concerned about them. What is the exact rule if they, if you're in the country and you're on a visa, you're safe for now? Just explain that, please. 
Yes, that's correct. So no H1 extensions, amendments, uh, change of statuses that's, that are happening in the country are affected, luckily. Uh, it's it's mainly because, you know, an executive order is, is based on uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act 212F. And as per 212F, it's only the president can only make um, um, add restrictions or make changes to arriving aliens. So it's only if you're out of the country and you're arriving into the country, and if he thinks that it's detrimental for certain aliens to come into the country, he can make changes based on 212F. So he's used that in this proclamation, and he's made changes to arriving L's and H's and J's, um, but he's made, he's at least put in some caveats to it, basically saying that if you have if you don't have a valid visa, then you you know you cannot come in. If you already have a valid visa stamped in your passport, then you can come into the country, even if you're a H, J, or L. But if you don't have a valid visa stamped in your passport, then you cannot come in. So that's what. And so most of the stories I'm hearing is people who have gone out of the country on a vacation uh, and their visas have expired because they haven't been able to come back, um, you know, before their visas expired and the consulates closed because of COVID. And so their families are stuck here, and they're there in India. So there's so many inst so many cases where I've heard that that has happened, and that's kind of heartbreaking because you know, imagine being away from your family for six months, and you have you know infant children, small children that you know need taking care of. So that's one instance. The other instances is in which they've actually gone um, to get their visa revalidated or extended. They've gone out of the country, and you know, COVID happened, and they couldn't. All the consulates were closed. And now Trump happens, so, so they can't come into the country uh, for that reason. And same thing, family separation is really heartbreaking. The other instance where people are affected is um, new H ones. So you know, people who haven't come in from the last cap, like the last H um, one B cap that we had, or people who are now going to get H one approved, and they will not be able to come in until uh, December thirty first or later. Presuming he doesn't extend it, then it'll be later. Um, so those are the two um, types of cases that are affected right now. Okay, thank you, Prashanti. Let me ask Cyrus, who's also been a long time uh, a immigration lawyer in New York and very much involved with the Immigrant Immigration Lawyers Association and other fora. Uh, can you explain what it is that Trump is trying to do? He and Stephen Miller uh, seem to feel like immigration is bad, even though Barron, Trump, three of his four uh, grandparents were uh, immigrants themselves and things like that. Can you just set the scene for us? What is happening so that people understand what is the ultimate goal of this administration? Sure. So uh, Trump has always been hostile towards immigrants. He ran on an anti-immigration platform in 2016, which got him a lot of traction. And he has continued to... Uh, issue these sort of executive orders from the time he became president. And he's now become a master at issuing these immigration bans one after another. This time he has used the pandemic as a basis to ban uh, immigrants. And for the very first time, he's banning skilled, uh, highly skilled foreign national workers who already have niche positions in US companies and all of a sudden, he's pulled a rug under their feet. And as Prashanti mentioned, some people unwittingly left the country for vacation or to get new visas. They've not been able to get visas. And now they have been snared by Trump's ban. Even though they're citing unemployment as a result of, of the pandemic, this is actually a xenophobe's dream that has come true. Because all the antipathy that they've had against H-1B workers and L-1 visa workers are all now encapsulated in this latest proclamation of President Trump. And the architect behind this, you mentioned, is Stephen Miller, who's a senior advisor. Each time Trump feels down in the polls, he wants to use immigration to try to boost his standings. Whether it will keep on succeeding remains a question. But at this point of time, he has, in addition to alienating a lot of people, he's also alienated corporate America because the Facebooks, the Googles, the casinos in Las Vegas, 
you name it, all kinds of industries have been impacted because the visas that they have deployed to bring in skilled workers are now have now been thwarted by this proclamation. So this is, I, I, I like how you describe it, though it's a terrible description, a xenophobe's dream, uh, as you said. And I've been telling for a long time, Prashanti, to my friends who are of Indian origin, who think that that the changes that were coming will will not touch them because they're highly skilled, highly educated. They have always thought that they're exempt from the xenophobia, exempt from the racism, exempt from the nationalism, because somehow they thought it makes them special because they went to IIT, the famous Indian technology uh, school, for example. So talk about that, please, Prashanti, and then we'll take some questions that are coming. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. That's that's very true. In fact, um, we were having a conversation, a couple of friends and I, with reference to Black Lives Matter and uh, everything that's happening right now uh, in the U.S. with police brutality, etc. And um, we were um, often I've heard, um, you know, the uh, the minority community or the black community be referred to as they, instead of saying us, you know. Uh, and it's because uh, if you're not born and brought up in this country, I guess you maybe it's possible that you don't see yourself as a person of color uh, because you don't know the difference. You don't know the history and you don't know what racism is about because you've been protected from that. But um, if you stay here long enough, you realize that, you know, you are also part of that same group. And it doesn't matter how you perceive yourself. What, is, what matters is how other people are perceiving you. And sometimes you miss that. And so you don't realize, uh, you know, what, um, you know, what to expect. So, um, yeah, I think it's not about they, it's about us. It's about everyone, no matter, you know, uh, which, what background you're from or what your education is. You know, the fact, in fact, the fact that you're um, an immigrant, uh, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not belittling, you know, people who are here and face prejudice and it's it's much more but i'm saying the fact that you're an immigrant the fact that you speak differently that you look different you know you speak with an accent you uh, you're brown skin uh, you're a minority it doesn't matter that you come from iit no the person on the street doesn't know where you're coming from or who you are it's just perception that's everything so you know i think we should recognize who we are and then um you know act as part of the group rather than um you know uh, saying they and we and you know I think we're part of that same group and then I think then we'll be more motivated to do it more um, you know that way I think that that's that's an important thing that I wanted to bring to light. Thank you Cyrus what is your thoughts on those on that particular question? Sorry go ahead. A lot of um, people who are here uh, trying to get their green cards are a bit scared if they speak out they feel that it may affect their status or they're not allowed to protest but that's that's untrue one of the wonderful things about the united states is that the first amendment protects everybody's right to free speech and as long as you're involved in peaceful protests uh, you can you can actually do it and it's very important for uh, immigrants and non-immigrants to speak up and to try to um, expose some of the hypocrisy and the racism of this administration uh, that that's very important, um, and you know, for example, this uh, pro proclamation, even though it has carve outs and it doesn't affect everybody. So, if you're in the United States, it won't affect you. If you were here on the day of the proclamation was passed, but then you leave the country, most likely it won't affect you. But there is a very pernicious provision in the proclamation that actually directs uh, the the offices of the Homeland Security and the Labor Department to also review whether people who've already entered on H-1 visas or who are applying for green cards or who have already come in on green cards under the employment-based second and third preference categories to see whether they disadvantage United States workers. And that's pretty uh, shocking because even after you've gone through the whole process, you may still be vulnerable. They may still say, oh, the labor certification that was done 10 years ago is stale. So now we are ordering your employer to do a new labor certification. And, um, you know, those kind of things are pretty scary. And um, 
it just makes everybody vulnerable in the United States. And just look at the way this proclamation has been titled. It's called Proclamation Suspending Entry of Aliens Who Present a Risk to the U.S. Labor Market Following the Coronavirus Outbreak. So highly skilled people who were taught of, to be contributing to the United States and contributing to their companies are now seen as risks to the U.S. labor market, which is completely untenable. Very important to challenge this proclamation, even though people who challenged the prior travel ban, it was known as the Muslim ban, and the Supreme Court upheld it. That doesn't mean that you can't go into court and challenge this, because these facts here are very distinguishable from the prior proclamation. And it may be possible to still win. And lawsuits are being um, mounted. You'll be seeing a lot of challenges in the courts in the coming days. And just so that everybody understands that when this was first announced, the version of this at the start of the pandemic, it was said it was temporary. Many of us said, why do we trust that it would be temporary? And here we are now, these months later. In fact, Prashanti was on my show, I think episode number 36, and here we are number 106. So in those 70 days, so much has changed and the president has decided to uh, focus on this. We're going to do our global tour, see where people are watching from all over the world. And then we're going to go back to our guests and ask them lots more questions around the issues of immigration. Also, let's find out what's happening in places like Canada. Are they going to take advantage? Is Germany going to be able to take advantage because they need high skilled workers? So I'm going to take both our guests off camera for just a couple of minutes so they can relax and uh, we'll bring them back on in just a minute. So uh, folks, we'll, we'll see you in just a minute. You can relax. You can uh, get on your phone and share this conversation with your friends because we want everybody to be able to watch this. We have so many people watching from around the world. So let's do our global tour and say hello to Jonathan Borstein watching from Union Square. He has watched for 106 straight episodes and in fact was our guest on our 100th episode. Radian is watching from Center Reach, Long Island. Thank you, Radian, for being here. Uh, Anand's watching from Andhra Pradesh in India. Greetings and welcome. Ashok is watching from Trivandrum in Kerala, Tiruvannathapuram, And our friend Diana is watching from Lake Tahoe in California. Diana works in the healthcare system in San Mateo County. And we're so grateful to every one of our healthcare workers for everything they have done for us all over the country, all over the world. Some of you remember in a very early episode, we went to Italy and we talked to three folks in Italy, including a doctor who had just come off the shift where she was working and so many people were dying every hour in Italy. And at that point, we looked at that and said, oh, America is safe compared to what's happening in Italy. And little did we know we would be in such terrible shape that we are here today. So thank you, Diana, and to all your colleagues. Let's keep going. Rose is here. Rose is tweeting at Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandanam underscore Menon, our two producers. Uh, let's see who's here. Omvesh is watching and says, um, well, he's got a question about the H-1B, so we will save that question for our lawyer friends. Anusha is watching from Short Hills, and I want to tell everybody who's watching, please tag your friends. This is such a valuable conversation. If they can watch it after this is over, anytime, it will be archived in the same spot. Apollo is watching from Vegas. Hello, and great to see you. My dad is watching, and I always am um, grateful to my parents for everything, but especially now, during the pandemic that I can be in touch with them every single day in this format. Terry is also in Vegas. And so we have two fans in Vegas. I hope you folks can connect. Uh, Ashok says, very important and useful discussion. Uh, Rick calls this more vindictive Trump behaviors, playing the alt-right playbook. That's what Cyrus told us. And we'll bring Cyrus on in just a minute along with Prashanti Reddy, our two lawyers. And my mom's also watching, hi, Amma. Love you, so glad that you can join us and just so happy that you can all be here. Um, I'll also tell you, I wanna show our lawyers uh, that we're getting remarks like this, send them back, deport. So it is not that everybody watching the show is all on the same page and the trolls are there, but we'll also ask our lawyers some serious questions about what do you do 
with 40 million unemployed people. So I'll ask them that question when they come back. Daryl says he was distracted by Liverpool, won the Premier League today for the first time, I believe, in 30 years. And I've been consuming all the celebrations. They're also current European and world champions. They won by 23 points with seven games left. Anyone here a football fan, a true football fan, soccer fan, you know this is very big news. And uh, we'll talk, uh, Paulo has a question we'll come back to. Uh, and here's another troll. I just want to show the trolls. We don't want to hide the trolls. So here's a troll that says, it's really funny to see a bunch of Indians talk about racism. In some cases, he is, that is not a troll, right? Because we see that Indians, not these Indians, the three of us were talking, but Indian Americans, as well as celebrities in India who talk about Black Lives Matter, but don't support the uh, the the various issues in India itself that's a problem. Among other things, the use of skin whitening creams, like whitening creams are completely normal. Celebrities endorse them. You cannot imagine that happening in a place like America, and that's the situation we're in. Uh, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar is here. She's the one of our two stars of the show. She's on call on Facebook, 11 to noon on Sundays. Please stay, please to tune in. She says, that, that may be the law, but so many immigrants are afraid. And we'll talk about protesting also. And uh, Apollo says, you're right. Uh, you're in the fight by Indians and others from other lands in America. Uh, Peter from Brooklyn says, fix America, not the world. These are all important uh, to say uh, that. Uh, I would say you do show how most of the Indian outsourcing organizations use the US system. So that's something we can talk about as well. And Daryl says, people are living in fear and fear freezes people. And it's exactly what he wanted. We need to get the message through that people have options. Really important. Aisha is watching from Toronto and I'll ask that question about Canada. So we're gonna go back to our guests in just a minute. I'm giving them a chance to just relax, uh, drop their shoulders, drink some water, share the show with their friends. I hope you're all doing it too. Christy says, hello from Toronto. Two Toronto folks back to back. Roberta is watching our dear friend, watching from Richmond, Virginia. She is at the Virginia uh, Center, Public Policy Center, uh, which is an incredible organization for in interfaith values. Please check out what they're doing, uh, really important. Let's do it, just a few more, and then we'll come back. And Joey Chen is watching. Joey, the incredible journalist. Many of you know her from Al Jazeera America, from CNN and a good friend and so glad that she's joining us. Marina is watching from Maplewood, New Jersey. Awesome writer, uh, author who I've interviewed multiple times, including on a US PBS show more than 22 years ago. And Roberta says this is a great show. Her show is also great. And we'll just, I think with that, we have all the comments. Uh, and Avinash says we need to get uh, Hassan Minaj to cover this. I don't know if he's covered immigration, but he's done a lot of good uh, stuff here, lots of other questions. So I think we are ready now to bring on our lawyers back so that we can get right to the questions uh, that are that are coming in that we, we need to answer. So let me bring back with great gratitude to my friends. Here are Cyrus Mehta. Hi, Cyrus. Hi. And here's Prashanti. Thank you. I hope you guys got a chance to relax, take a deep breath. And uh, let's talk now on very serious issues. So much happening all over the world that we need to talk to. First, talk, uh, Cyrus, if you could, to the trolls that are saying, send them back. This is nothing to do with America. We don't need immigrants. Talk to them first, please, Cyrus. It is true, and we have to acknowledge that people have lost jobs in the pandemic. The economy was doing really well. The unemployment rate was at its uh, lowest point before the pandemic hit the United States. And now we are seeing uh, huge unemployment numbers. So we, we need to acknowledge that people are out of jobs. But these kind of travel bans that the Trump administration has imposed won't bring back or protect American jobs. If a company has sponsored a CEO from its foreign subsidiary in Germany to come to the United States to head the company here, these jobs are very specialized. They occupy niche positions. And uh, if you bring these people into the United States and keep them, they in turn will allow the companies to prosper and allow America to recover and create more jobs. 
for instance, all the great companies of the United States, Google, and um, now we are also uh, looking at Tesla and uh, his company, SpaceX. They've done great innovation. They're all immigrants. They Many of them came on H-1 visas, the very same visa that has been now uh, barred under Trump's proclamation. I don't believe this proclamation is going to protect American jobs and bring them back. These people are specialized. There are people who've been working in companies for 10 years. They're just waiting for their green cards, but for the quotas. And to now deprive that person from coming back to the U.S. just because she left for vacation, that job's not going to go to uh, an American worker. These people are actually part of the economy, part of the recovery, and by blocking them, it's just going to hurt the United States more, and it's going to be a gift to other countries, like Canada, for example. Canada will try to attract these people. It's also people have also gotten used to working remotely. So you can see uh, companies just shifting operations, and these people are highly placed, who have um, mobility, who have the ability to buy houses. They won't be here in the United States to help the economy recover. And when times are good, these people won't be there to continue the innovation and to keep America the leading country as far as uh, innovation, growth, and prosperity is concerned. Yeah, thank you, Cyrus. Very valid points and very important for us to all understand that. Uh, Joey Chen, my friend and uh, someone who's very involved with young people in terms of higher ed, asks a very good question about OPT. So let me ask Prashanti about that, about the uh, optional practical training that allows people to be here. What, do you, what does all of this mean for students who graduate? Many of you will remember that Tom Friedman has told us that everybody who graduates with certain higher uh, high ed degrees, higher ed degrees should have a green card stapled to their diplomas. We're going from that to complete backward situation. But OPT is just one step between you finish your school, you do OPT, then you get an H1. There are millions of people have done that, millions of people who've paid taxes, millions of people have done so much good for this country. Please talk about the OPT uh, situation, Prashanti. Shri, if I may just add first to what um, Cyrus said about, you know, um, immigration being good for the country and why this proclamation is a farce. Uh, uh, if, do, can I talk about that for a minute? Of course, of course. So um, the other point that we should uh, keep in mind is that the H1s are taken up, 80% of the H1s are taking up, taken up by the tech industry. And there has never been any recession in the tech industry, never. There's always a shortage in the tech industry, especially for experienced people. And experienced people can come only via H1s. Um, you can bring students and then, you know, but they're all entry level. The experienced people are have to come via H1s. And if you look at the job market and if you look at unemployment rates, and this was published um, recently, uh, and I was reading it on Forbes, but um, the unemployment rate was um, 3% in uh, March for the tech industry, and it's it was it became two percent in May. So there's in fact a lower unemployment rate uh, among the tech the tech people, and that's where the H ones are, are used. Eighty percent of the H ones, anyone can look that up. So what's going to happen if you stop people from coming into the country? If you stop um, tech graduates from coming into the country, you know what's going to happen? All those jobs are going to go abroad. So then how is uh, the American economy uh, benefited from that? Where, where does the tax money go then? I mean, then no one's paying taxes. The real estate goes down. Um, nobody's in the grocery stores. Nobody's in you know the malls. Uh, the number of visitors that come in through the immigrants, everyone has their parents coming in in the summer. And then they spend money. You know, and then they travel. They go to Niagara Falls or wherever it is that they, they go to Niagara Falls for sure. Falls for sure. But, but you know, so this is what happens, and this is a reality that not many people know, unless you are in, you know, in immigration or you know, you know a little bit about immigration. So I just wanted to um, say that before I went to the OPTs. But with reference to OPTs, um, right now OPTs are not affected. 
um, they can file for a change of status. Uh, if, they're, if they get selected in the CAP, they can file for a change of status from F1 to H1 uh, seamlessly, and they can start working on October 1st if their H1 gets approved by then. The only thing that they cannot do right now is travel, uh, because if they leave the country, then they can't come back. So they shouldn't be traveling until uh, December 31st. And if it goes beyond that, then, you know, that's a scary thing. I don't know what's going to happen. But as Cyrus was also saying, the proclamation has um, has certain directives um, written to the Secretary of State and the Department of Labor, asking them to look into uh, the labor market and look, look in and see how H1s are affecting, you know, uh, American jobs and see what can be done. So. The Trump administration has an agenda already in place. All they're doing through these proclamations is, you know, making that agenda real and using COVID as an excuse. So one of their, their biggest agenda is the OPTs. They want to take away optional practical training from students. And I thought it would happen in this proclamation. A lot of people thought it did, but luckily it looks like the educational institutions didn't allow that to happen. Um, or maybe he thought that um, since he can only stop new OPTs from coming in. Maybe that won't have much of an effect. So he thought it wasn't worth putting that in. But you can definitely see, you will see more regulation that will affect work visas and students in the future if um, he wins the elections. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind. So let's uh, tell everyone, folks, please tag your friends. I'm learning so much. I know you're also learning so much share right now with your friends and family all over the world they should be watching this even if you don't have any connection to immigrants which is very unlikely please share this so that more people can watch and learn i just want to say there is another side of this and i particularly wanted to show both of you an indian's comment about this and an indian writes kiran joy b writes on twitter at real donald trump is the best potus ever it's shameful to see indians who have been given the privilege of being American, spread hate and lies. So please tell me, Cyrus Mehta, why are you spreading hate and lies? Well, I would like to point out to this person that his president is the biggest spreader of hate and lies. And um, all I'm doing is to call him out. I don't think this president has been good for immigrants. I'm an immigration lawyer. I advocate for immigrants. And I would like to see this president defeated. This is a free country. This is a democracy. So I have the right to vote and I have the right to advocate against a president whom I believe is not just detrimental to immigrants, but detrimental to the values of the United States that I have cherished and known to uh, um, be fond of and, and be proud of. Um, so uh, that's my response. This is my personal opinion. And I'm sure millions of people share this opinion and we'll have to wait till November to see what happens. Here is Yoshita says, uh, the fine print in the proclamation says there could be ta action targeting people with H-1B visas who are already in the US. How worried should they be, you know, those in the country be? You already addressed this, but in this show, people keep coming every minute. So can you just mention that again? Why sure. be concerned? And by the way, Yoshita, terrific journalist, who writes for PTI, the Press Trust of India. Yeah, thank you, Yoshita. Uh, that's a good question. It is in the fine print. And right now it has no legal effect. It's just a directive, but it's a directive that would encourage the various departments that administer immigration law to um, look at it and issue new regulations. All this will take time. So at this point of time, I don't want to spread any panic and it may not happen, and it may not happen by November, but it is something to be concerned about. It's something to watch out for. I also want to make one clarification. When we were speaking about OPTs, those are people on F1 visas in F1 status. This proclamation does not apply to people in F1 status. So uh, Prashanti, they can travel uh, abroad, if they don't come back, it may be related to COVID reasons or the consulate right. is closed and they won't be able to get visas, but they right. won't be directly impacted by this proclamation. That's correct. Yeah. One, one thing that I, I do want to ask, uh, there are people watching whose children are, you know, thinking of coming to the U.S. this fall. Forget the COVID 
issues, obviously, whether it's online, offline, et cetera. What is your message to them who might be, they're watching in Singapore, Australia, India, China, and they're wondering, should I send my kid to America? Will they have uh, a chance to work in, and uh, become, you know, get work, work experience here? They may want to go back, but what is the thinking there, Prashanti, on that question? Um, again, that's, uh, I, I, I think America is still um, the land of opportunity and, you know, the land where dreams can come true. And um, and I, I think they shouldn't hesitate in sending their children here um, because there is still innovation and opportunity here that like there is in no other country. And every country has its, you know, goods and bads, good things and bad things about it, I think. And it, it because it's a country is made up of people. So, you know, there are good and bad everywhere. So, um, and America has always been very welcoming to immigrants and has uh, has realized because it's a country of a nation of immigrants by itself. So it has realized, um, it does realize the importance of immigration. It's just that this administration, due to whatever political reasons that they might be, um, are following a different uh, different path. Thank you. Pradeep Singh, who's watching from Bangalore, he's headed to Seattle on Sunday. I'm glad you're able to come back to the US, Pradeep. Hi. Here's a question. What's the status on fiancé visas under the new regulations? Let's go to Cyrus for that. Right. So this is not really a regulation because a regulation requires a lot more procedure. These are executive orders. So the fiancé visas, the K-1 visa, this proclamation does not impact um, the K-1 visa, even the prior proclamation that banned would-be immigrants from coming into the United States did not impact people coming in on K-1s as fiancés. Okay, so that's that's good. And of course, the president is married to a person who was on one of these visas at one point herself. Yeah, I so, you know, yeah, to just kind of, you know, take on from where Prashanti left, uh, I'm also kind of still optimistic because there's always a pendulum in the United States historically. Uh, it's shifted. You know, there have been times when there has been more uh, anti-immigration hysteria and then the pendulum shifts. So this will be short-lived. We're going through this phase. I am quite optimistic that the fever will break. It may break quite quickly after the November election, but it remains to be seen. But this is, after all, a nation of immigrants and the people of the United States inherently do recognize the contributions of immigrants. Everybody is not hostile to uh, immigrants um, at all. So I would not um, uh, dissuade people from coming to the U.S. because by the time their children graduate, it will be a few years and things would change. All right. That's very optimistic. Isabella is watching from Staten Island. Hello. And uh, Apollo says he loves that Sri's parents are, are are watching, and we love that too. And there, Peter says lies. So this is the trolling that these people are wanting to, instead of coming in and presenting facts, just shouting lies and running away is not a way to do this. Uh, and, uh, and and really sad that this is the way uh, to, uh, to do that. Many people are tagging their friends. We appreciate it. Vandana has breaking news for us. The fairness cream, fair and lovely, is dropping the word fair. But it's still a skin whitening product, though. So uh, I don't know how exactly that works. And maybe we need a whole show just on that. Raghav is saying H HLL has informed that they will be changing the name of its famous brand, Fair and Lovely. I think that one's Fair and Handsome, maybe. And uh, Pushpa is watching from Chicago. Hello. Uh, we have someone watching from DC over on LinkedIn. We're on all these platforms, folks. So go in there and please share so that friends can join us. Sony is watching. Uh, tonight from Raleigh, North Carolina. Geeta is watching from Memphis. Great to see you again. And Sujana says that she loves that her cousin's kids, U.S. born and bred, are interested and in watching. Isn't that nice that even people who are one step removed care and understand that this is a big deal? Uh, let's see, Apollo has a long comment here. I worked in India for a BPO, which is a body, uh, a business process outsourcing company. This is one reason why the U.S. should join the Commonwealth. So much potential wealth to be developed from U.S. investment into the Commonwealth. So he is a big fan of the Commonwealth. And of course, England itself is having its own issues, right? Brexit and is going to make it much harder for people to stay and work there. This is exactly what we are talking about. Anand says, I'm, I'd love to listen more about Canada. 
Justin Trudeau is a great leader. This is like an ad for Canada. And here is Apollo. Yes, we win with immigration. And uh, here's someone, Ordinary Talk says, body shopping is what business is called within IT services world. Bunch of bodies who've been shopped and sold on exchanges, labor market. So let's clarify that a little bit. It is true that during the John Kerry run, for example, in 2004, it were Democrats who were against these visas, against body, what was called body shopping. But that seems to have, you rarely hear the term body shopping anymore. For something, what is the difference between what was happening with the Democrats against this kind of uh, international H-1B transfers and what is happening today? Please explain that. So um, there's always the naysayers. There's always two two different opinions, and you know what happens. Every law is, every there is always a law that is misused. You know, but the sad part is what happens. So, for example, the, this whole thing. There's a big controversy uh, around that time, where um, Disney, I think, um, hired. Uh, H-1B workers and fired all the local American workers and they were hiring the H-1B workers for a lower wage. Um, and they were doing that like any corporate America, they were trying to get, you know, uh, take advantage of, uh, to increase their profit margins. Um, so, but sadly what happens is only the bad news gets reported and then gets ex exposure and then, you know, everybody goes on talking about it and then, um, uh, you know, uh, says the same thing over and over again, and the newspapers keep covering it. So every, in a, wherever, whenever there's a law, there's all, it's always misuse. There's some extent of misuse, and that is so even with the H-1B program. It has been misused. Uh, there, there has been fraud, but the way to go is to not take away an amazing program. Um, but the way to go is to prevent the fraud, right? Um, by, And they're already doing that. USC has the amount of um, uh, fraud prevention that they have now and the processing and uh, you know if you look at the number of H-1Bs filed versus how many are approved it's like 50% of them are approved um, well actually there's about 50% are RFE and then about 50% of that are approved so there's already a vetting process in place to prevent fraud and that happens in every you know everywhere where every law is concerned that doesn't mean that the law by itself is bad um, so yeah. that's my take on the H-1B program here is Apollo saying the privilege of being American. How obnoxious this is what one of somebody had said earlier. We're all immigrants and black Americans pressed for the expansion of citizenship for so many with the 14th Amendment. I can imagine how many people have been made anxious. This is a deliberate trigger on the personal psychological level by the president. Um, mm -hmm. Daryl has a question. Cyrus, does this affect people who have been approved for green card but still need to send in the application? And what is this we hear about 10-year waits, 20-year waits. What is that exactly so that people understand the situation? Yeah, so the H-1 visa is a non-immigrant visa, and it serves as a bridge to people who are ultimately sponsored for permanent residence. Unfortunately, if you were born in India and to some extent China, because there are per-country limits in the immigration caps every year, people from India are the most disadvantaged. And they have to wait for decades before they can get their green cards. The waits are impossibly long. So people have already been waiting. They're already very vulnerable to getting denied the next time they apply for their H-1B extension, because as Prashanti said, the H-1B um, request is scrutinized under a microscope. And now to rub salt in the wound, you have this proclamation that puts these people who've been waiting for 10 plus years in jeopardy because if they leave the United States and um, they were not here, let's say if somebody was here on the day of the proclamation and they leave, it doesn't apply. But let's say someone who wants to come into the United States and who was outside and does not have a visa, that person who has been waiting for 10 years or more is now impacted by the proclamation and nothing can be more cruel than this. These people have contributed to the US and they you know, now become slaves to the legal immigration system and to their companies because they have no mobility and, and they have to continue working in the H-1B 
uh, status and they are impacted by this new proclamation, which is very problematic and very sad and very cruel. And that's what many people don't understand about these. Uh, and you, you said on Twitter, everybody who's on Twitter, please follow at Cyrus Mehta. It's depraved to think that American jobs will be protected under the ban if a skilled H-1B working for 10 plus years and caught in the green card backlogs is stranded in India because it could not get his visa stamped in time due to COVID and his family is left behind in the US. These are real cases. These are real people that are being affected by all of this. And it's certainly problematic. The other thing that I wanted to show uh, folks uh, so that they understand, we talk about this a lot on this show, is the impact of, of what happens with immigration. And here you're looking at global companies uh, with, Amer uh, with CEOs of Indian origin. Almost every one of these people came here on an H1 or an F1, then became an H1, J1. Look at these brands. These are CEOs of these companies, Adobe, Albertsons, Ansys, Diageo, Deloitte, Flex, Gap, Harman, Harman CEO just stepped down, IBM, Google, MasterCard, just Microsoft, Nokia, Novartis, look at these names, Reckitt Bensicker, by the way, uh, ben, uh, ben, ben, Bensicker it makes, those are the folks who make uh, Dettol products, Wayfair, we, uh, WeWork, Workday, the FedEx president and COO, Women2, all of them uh, were people who came here on F1s or H1s and stayed and contributed to this country. So it's very important to remember that when we're talking about what immigrants do here. There are also great stats about the number of Silicon Valley companies where founders were immigrants from all over. When people talk about Zoom, the CEO of Zoom, the founder of Zoom was not born in the United States. And so this is what immigrants do. We're not saying that let in everybody because pointing to fraud, as we have learned that this president does about mail-in voting, right? He says it's all fraud. You remember he also said that 3 million people voted uh, illegally in the last election. All of this is fraud and lies from him. Uh, Yoshita says, thanks, uh, Cyrus and Sri. Much needed discussion since there's so much uncertainty already due to COVID restrictions and the proclamation adds to the anxiety of people manifold. And this is something that we're certainly looking at here. And we, we want people um, to understand the various aspects of this. Arlene says, I work for a law firm whose business is largely based on H1B visas. We're worried about the future of the business. Prashanti, you make a living in part from H1B visas. Tell us about how concerned you are about what happens. Um, yes, we've been concerned for the last couple of years because um, um, there is a need in the market for, um, you know, for talented people, but unfortunately, um, all the jobs, I've just literally been, there's so many examples where the jobs could not be filled and they just went to other countries. Um, and so, you know, less and less H1s um, and mainly small businesses, small companies are hit because, you know, they don't have the, um, the filing fees are so expensive and now they want to increase the filing fees. So it's small businesses that are hit uh, the most. Uh, and these small businesses, you know, they, um, you know, so they bring in consultant and they have, they don't, maybe they're not able to submit as, you know, much paperwork as the larger companies are able to. So um, it's been an uphill task over the last couple of years to file H1s and to get them approved. Um, and just the anxiety of, it's amazing. It's just sad to see. I, I can't even imagine how a person on H1 can survive, you know, because they don't know tomorrow, especially in the tech company, because whenever you change jobs or even change your location of your job, you have to file an amendment. And when you do you do that, you don't know uh, whether the case will get approved or it'll get denied. If it gets denied, you have to just pack up bag and baggage and leave and along with your family. So there's constant, a constant sense of anxiety, uh, you know, among the H1B holders. And um, the sense that they don't belong and they can't establish roots because they can't buy property, they can't buy a house, they can't buy a car. So it's just a very sad situation to be in uh, right now, to be on a H-1B. So that's what I'm seeing in my practice. Well, here's Peter sticking around and saying nobody from China should be allowed into this country. And China also takes up a lot of the H-1B 
L1 and other visas as well. Here's some interesting stats for everybody to look at. This is from Canada is pointing this out. This was last year before things went even worse that the H1B approvals on entry used to be 95.7%. Now it's 61.5%. That means after approval. So that has changed because of this administration. Request for evidence for visa approval, 22%. And uh, now it's 60%. And charges of smuggling and fraud related to marriage proof have increased 50% since 2015. These are American stats being shown to people by the organization called Code in Canada. And they are reaching out and saying to Americans and foreigners, come work in Canada. So it's very clever, I think, of them. What do you, how do, what is your reaction to this, Cyrus? Yeah, so I really think that uh, there's no need to put so much scrutiny on H1s. It's basically a visa application. And uh, when I started my career, it was a one or two page letter and a very thin application. Now you have to write a brief as if you're going into federal court. There's, there's no need for that. It's a waste of money for the client. And the lawyer also need not um, spend so much time on H-1 visas. I believe there's enough work, there's enough complexity in the immigration law for lawyers to be getting business from other quarters. I'm concerned about helping my clients. I don't want my clients to get uh, impacted and I'm also concerned about the United States. There's really no need for all this kind of scrutiny and all these denials and things. And I hope I hope uh, it will change. And um, I do see some some shift in recent times where the denial rate has lessened in the last two months. Maybe it's because of COVID. Maybe the examiners uh, are not paying that much attention. But no, I'm just being facetious. The reason why there is a change is because there have been lawsuits against the administration for denying H-1B visas. And a lot more lawyers and our bar association, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, has is inspired other lawyers to file lawsuits under the Administrative Procedure Act when the denial was arbitrary and capricious. A lot of H-1B denials are arbitrary and capricious. There's no basis to them. And in the past, one would file an administrative appeal, which would then be uh, affirmed. But now if you go to federal court, you have a real judge who says, hey, what's going on? This judge has not really been trained in immigration law. And whether the judge may be a Republican appointed or Democrat appointed, it doesn't make sense. You know, it, it totally violates the way the decision was made. So a lot of these cases can be challenged in federal court. And as a result of that, at least at this point of time, the administration has backed down and there are fewer denials. So these statistics are a little old and, and those are trying to lure people into Canada should look at the latest statistics, uh, which is coming from the horse's mouth uh, because we're doing these every day. But of course the Trump administration may come out with new rules and regulations to counter the impact of these of these decisions. And it remains to be seen whether they will be successful because to promulgate a regulation takes a lot more effort and a lot more time. And there are only about four and a half months left before uh, the November election. All right, we've, we're almost out of time and we have so many questions and comments. So short questions and short answers as well. Piyush uh, says, hello from uh, Dunagiri in the or Dunagiri in the uh, Himalayas. Alok is watching from Wisconsin. George is watching from Columbus Circle. My mom says very important discussion. And Rebecca is watching from Australia. So you went to India, Wisconsin, and Columbus Circle, and to Australia, all in just a few seconds. Uh, we have an appalling refugee policy, and you would think that Australia would be a destination for immigrants, but they've also become very tight on how they're how they're doing this. And Radian is pointing out to the work of Tyler and Binder and, uh, and uh, talking about this. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Prakash or Prash Talk says, can or will this EO be challenged in court? Prashati, do you know? Uh, for sure. For sure. Okay. It will be challenged in court. And um, 
whether it'll survive in court or not, um, I, I think it has a lot of things going against it. First thing is he, the reason he's given an economic reason for the proclamation. And usually economic reason is a bad reason. If you were given a health reason and said, you know, we don't want people coming in because we have health concerns, uh, maybe he would have done better in court. And the second thing is the previous proclamation was only for 60 days. This is for six months, much longer. Uh, so that's another thing that it has going against it. And the third and most important thing is that he's basically saying that what 20 million or something jobs were lost uh, in those industries which hire H1s, and that's the complete farce. It's untrue. They were not lost in those industries which hire H1s. As I was pointing out, you know, the, the unemployment rate has in fact gone down in the tech industry because of remote uh, working and, you know, I guess uh, remote working just lends itself better to the tech industry than, you know, going physically and go going to work. So uh, most employees have been more productive than in, they would have been in the office space. So yeah, um, we're all working way too hard, right? That's the we're work, yeah, we, yeah, we're not stopping at five. And, you know, we don't seem to have a demarcation of when it's between the office and the home anymore. But as I was saying, the economy, that's the biggest reason. If he's giving that as a reason, then, you know, that can be easily shown to be, you know, untrue. Right. And, you know, I'm just looking forward to see what will happen in court. Thank you. Sony says, what does this mean for H1 folks whose visas expire between now and December, Cyrus? If they, uh, if they were here in the United States on June 24th, and at least this is the interpretation right now in the proclamation, it might change. If they leave the United States to get a new visa, they can do that. If they happen to be here, they can get extensions of their status. They can process their cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, as, as Apollo points out, getting to America has always been hard. I never want to interview with friends who would work in consulate services for a State Department. It's a hostile process, he says. And uh, a LinkedIn user asked the TN visa, I'm not familiar with that, was exempt. What is that, Prashanti, and why? So the TN, even I, I was wondering that, you know, um, that the TN visa was, uh, that, that occurred to me as well. But I'm, I, this is basically for Canadian, um, citizens and, and Mexico and for Mexican citizens for the Canada and Mexico and nationals. Um, and I'm presuming it's it was exempt because maybe there are not that many TN visas coming in when compared to H's. Maybe Cyrus has some other insight into it, but I'm thinking it's because it's not that many. Well, it's so also because it's part of the treaty with, with Canada and all Canadians are exempt from this proclamation, even if they're entering on H1s or L1 visas, which are specifically banned under this proclamation, Canadians are exempted. This is the latest news because Canadians don't need visas to come into the US. Right. Just, and to visit, so, yeah, just to visit, but to work. Yeah, and you know, they're trying to kind of create all kinds of exceptions. So when it goes to court, they'll say, see, there are so many carve outs and it's not so bad, but actually actually, that's that's uh, false. Uh, there, are, there are lots of points. And I just want to quickly add, that even though the Supreme Court held that the president has unbridled discretion under Section 212F, the president can't rewrite the law. Congress has actually passed provisions, the H-1 and L-1 provision. The president can't use 212F to rewrite the law, which he has done through this proclamation and the prior immigrant ban proclamation. Great. By the way, Rakesh Call says, I like Cyrus. He's my go-to guy on immigration matters. So you have a fan there. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Devanshi says, is O-1 and O-3 visa affected? I'm not familiar with those names. Yeah, so the, they're not affected. The O-1, O-1 applies to people of extraordinary ability. They have not uh, included the O-1. On the other hand, the L-1, which applies to highly placed managers and executives and very specialized knowledge employees who are intra-company transferees have been included. And that's been a shocker because this is going to have an impact on American companies who want to send their people to Europe and other countries. There could be retaliation. And of course, the best way to learn how to be a global manager is to work outside the United States. And so many people yes. who come back to be heads of corporations have spent time in other countries, in Asia, in other places, in Europe, and learn those skills and come back 
and help manage people better here. So this is so short-sighted. Um, and, and uh, also, if I may add, Sri, that um, for the L ones, they're not really taking up anyone's job. You know, so it's not like if they're not given a job, then uh, a U.S. citizen can take up that job because these jobs are highly specialized and they're they have to have knowledge of the company, knowledge based, you know, of the company, and that's that's what the L one is. So it's really there's no um, uh, detriment to the economy with the L one. So I was very surprised when I heard that L one was included as well. Thank you, Raghavinder uh, is uh, saying hello from Bedford, New Hampshire. Uh, sorry, I'm late, but no worries. You can watch it right away on the recording. It comes up right after this. Um, I, have you talked about EOS and you see people with issues for them? What is EOS? EOS uh, applies to, I believe, extension of status. status. And so if somebody's already in the United States and is applying to extend their H1 or L status, even though it's in the proclamation, they're, they're exempted. They can apply for extension of status while in the United States. Thank you. Aisha says, what happens if the visa is approved, but the passport is not stamped? Very specific. Prashanti? Yeah, so um, there, you are, there's often confusion between the term visa and I-94. So if a, the visa, when she says visa, I think she means the H-1B is approved, like the ISA, she gets the actual approval. If the visa is not stamped, if she's in the country, then they're fine. But if they're outside the country and they don't have a valid visa, then they're out of luck. They have to wait until you know the proclamation expires. And here is somebody with a Confederate flag, so you know this is a rational human being. Says, kick all the dreamers out. And I'll ask Cyrus to, uh, so that everyone who understands the huge Im uh, impact that uh, the victory that was won, it is not a permanent victory, but it is a victory at least for now. Can you talk about that, please, Cyrus? Yeah, so the dreamers are uh, people who came as youths under the age of 16 and fell out of status for no fault of their own. And this was um, an Obama era program. All that Obama did was to exercise deferred action or forbearance. Presidents even before him, Republican presidents like President Bush, President Reagan have used deferred action for large numbers of people. And that's what Obama did with these youths. And recently, just last week, the Supreme Court held that the Trump administration did not rescind the DACA program appropriately under the law. That's all that the Supreme Court said, that they didn't rescind the program. And one of the reasons was that there's been a lot of reliance on DACA since 2012, not just by the dreamers that this Confederate flag person wants to kick out, but the companies that hire them, the hospitals that need them during the COVID period, Many DACA recipients have become lawyers. They've even become politicians um, after they've, uh, you know, um, become permanent residents. And so uh, to kind of have this attitude, kick them all out, just doesn't make sense. This is the most sympathetic group of immigrants. And even among Trump's base, people are sympathetic towards the dreamers. Raghav, Raghav says, uh, thank you for all you do, Cyrus. I follow you on Twitter. You're a very active Twitter presence. So that's what uh, someone just came in and shouted law and order. I'm not sure what that means. It's a good show. Maybe they're talking Maybe about Trump. <laughs> yes. Aisha says, thank you. This is very helpful. And Apollo says, the rebel flag, what a loser. And uh, and and uh, uh, so here's, here's a question again from the dreamer person. I'm sorry to show this flag. It's evil. Uh, flag of losers. Uh, those Some of those people are in their 40s. Why didn't they apply till now, Cyrus, is the question that they're asking as an excuse to go after the dreamers now. You know, it's, it's, it's not easy to just apply for citizenship. The immigration laws are very complex and uh, most people can't apply for uh, citizenship uh, right away. Uh, a lot of people say, why can't these people come in the line like my grandparents or great-grandparents -grand did? Um, in the early 19th, 20th century and before that, the, there was no immigration law. People could actually come on a steamship and immigrate into the United States. Right now, the laws are very complicated. And, um, and so people are working with the laws 
And the laws are not perfect. The laws need to be updated. Congress is very polarized. What we need is a reform in our immigration law that would benefit the United States, not just immigrants, but that would benefit this country, uh, that would benefit U.S. employers, that would benefit uh, uh, Americans who need immigrants to work on farms for their fruit produce and factories and restaurants. And so we do need an update in our immigration law, which we don't at this point. Vikram says, in coming days, what do you think will be the impact on PERM filing, the permanent filing? I'm not sure. Uh, Prashanti, explain, please. That's basically labor certification. So that's, a, you know, that's one of the ways you can get a green card through employment. If you're trying to get a green card, then that's the first stage is the labor certification. So there is a directive in, in this proclamation, and that's what he's referring to, I think, where the, they're asking the Labor Department, Trump is asking the Labor Department to look into how these filings affect, um, you know, jobs, American jobs. Are they taking away American jobs? So I'm thinking that maybe um, they'll start having, um, they'll change the process a little bit and have supervised recruitment on every single case. It's difficult to say what uh, what directives or what, what advice will come out of it. But um, yeah, so supervised recruitment is pretty much, you know, when you file um, an advertisement, you're filing saying that, you know, you're looking for such and such position. And then if you don't get any qualified resumes of US citizens or permanent residents, then you can go ahead with the process. So in this case, um, the onus is on the employers to get, gather all the resumes and do the proper recruitment. But in supervised recruitment, the, all the resumes go directly to the labor department. And right. that has been used on and off, especially when the economy is bad. They, they use su uh, supervised recruitment a lot. Here's our friend, non-friend with the uh, rebel flag says, uh, I have no problem if they apply for citizenship. Talk about dreamers as if they were holding back. As if they don't want to. <laughs> they could not do it. That was the case. Uh, Jay asks, does the approved EB perm getting reviewed again by this proclamation? Well, I, it, it directs, um, as Prashanti said, the Labor Department to review. I like that Cyrus is looking through the documents right now. Cyrus, yeah. So, so, so it, it actually directs them to do it. Whether um, this has any legal impact right now remains to be seen, but uh, there is a directive. And it's Manushi, scary, actually. Yeah, Manushi says, what happens to F1 holders that applied for H1 this year and are on the end of their OPT? Manushi, uh, this is a question for Prashanti. Nothing happens to them. They have, um, you know, it doesn't affect them because they're not outside the country. Uh, their process goes on as usual. You can file a change of status from F1 to H1 uh, and come October 1st, if your H1 is approved, then you can be on, on H1 status. As I said, the only problem occurs is if they leave the country um, and they, they, then they cannot come back until October, uh, December 31st. But if they're here already in the US and they leave, right now under the proclamation, they can come back if they were if here on the day of the proclamation. Even if they don't have a visa, they can get a visa. Even if they, yeah, they can get a visa. Right. Here is, uh, Rose has put to, uh, posted a Washington Post story about the visa restrictions in, uh, explained. So please click through on Facebook. So much good information. Uh, the Confederate flag person says, this is not the Confederate flag. This is some other version, but still a flag of losers. Uh, why a banning H-4 visa? They are no threat to US citizen job. Explain what the H-4 is, please, Cyrus. The H-4 visa is the dependent visa for a spouse. So I, you know, does that mean that a spouse is not allowed to join the principal H-1B visa holder along with the children? That doesn't make sense. You want to have the whole family come into the country. The issue is that the H-4 spouse under certain conditions can also apply for a work permit. And that has been a point of contention for the Trump administration. They've been trying to abolish the ability of an H-4 spouse to get a work permit. So far, they have not been successful in rescinding the regulation. Okay, very last few things. Radhyan says, please note that many, if not all the anti-immigrant talk is only anti-immigrant if the immigrants aren't of European ancestry. And this is a point that I've been making, and I think you both agree, that Trump would rather have Norwegian fishermen than doctors and uh, engineers but those Norwegian fishermen want nothing to do with America. They're very happy where they are. They don't want to be dragged into this fight. And uh, first the H-4, then the H-1, any other countries going this, these routes. I'm not 
sure exactly uh, the reference here, but what are some options for people who are finding that they, they're highly skilled, they want to go to work? Are there other countries apart from Canada that are more friendly and therefore putting at risk American ingenuity, innovation, things like that? There are countries that have uh, better immigration laws than the United States. Uh, they're more flexible and they move with the time. So, for example, Germany has attracted uh, highly skilled people, but then they have to learn um, the German language. Uh, Canada has a great immigration program. Uh, one can immigrate to New Zealand, for example. So, yeah, you know, there may be countries that are more uh, flexible with regards to attracting um, skilled immigrants. Um, at the same time, uh, the United States uh, does offer a lot of opportunities. So, so would-be immigrants still want to come to the U.S. and overcome all the barriers and obstacles so they can succeed and build the next Google or the next Tesla? Uh, Jonathan says, actually, European immigrants are worried about this impact as well. So that's, that's important to understand as well. A, a very specific question. What about citizens who are minors, who are stuck with H4 caretakers, who are stuck outside? Prashanti. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's no exception if you're a parent of a US citizen minor child. I think if the proclamation still applies to you, uh, there's no exception for that. All right, last question. Arlene says, Prashanti mentioned resumes going to the labor department. Can you go into more detail, please, Prashanti? And then I'm gonna give each of you a chance to give us a final thought as the comments keep coming. I hope you'll both go into my Facebook and answer some of those uh, later, either today or tomorrow. So Prashanti, please go ahead. So um, I was just talking about the labor certification process. In, in the labor certification process, you're supposed to first advertise in certain media. And then um, once you advertise, if you don't get any resumes um, that qualify for the job, then you can show that there are no US citizens or permanent residents who uh, were available for the job and therefore you're not taking up you know a u.s citizen's job person's job and then you can go ahead with the first step which is a labor certification so usually the onus uh, is on the employer to uh, report you know to submit the documents and be truthful and uh, submit the resumes and send in a recruitment report as you would call it which is a report which basically has the number of resumes that came in the applicants that came in their skill sets and why they were disqualified. You have to give valid reasoning as to why they're disqualified. So this onus is on the employers and it's um, uh, so it's an honor system kind of thing. Um, so the Labor Department doesn't really um, do detective work usually. Uh, it, it's left to the employers to be truthful. But in some instances, especially when maybe the employer is blacklisted or when, you know, there's a situation where, um, you know, the economy is not that great. They go. They have a supervised recruitment process, whereby the officer will ask for the resumes to be sent directly in the advertisement itself. The resumes are directed to directly to the labor department, uh, and then the the labor department will send the resumes to the employer, so that you know um, there's no fraud there, uh, and um, just to make sure that no resumes are being missed. Uh, and then you have to undergo the same recruitment report. You have to submit a recruitment report, give reasons for why. Um, resumes, are, you know, a particular applicant was rejected, and if there are valid reasons, then you can go ahead with the process. All right, thank you. Radian says that uh, heritage, not hate, is an utter lie. I've heard it too many times. It's a red flag if potential friend or colleague claims that. He was talking about uh, the uh, the the uh, Confederate flag, of course. Uh, as you think of your final comments, I'm going to ask just ask this question: What do you say to immigrants on work visas? if Trump administration is getting four more years. We won't know till November 4th uh, what the situation is, but keeping that question in mind, I'm gonna ask uh, our friend Cyrus Mehta to give us his final thought for today. And I hope he and Prashanti will join us in the months ahead. Please go ahead, Cyrus. Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to answer that question in my final comments. Even if President Trump gets four more years, Hopefully, it will still be a country of laws and the administration would have to abide by the laws. So if the laws are applied arbitrarily, one can still go into courts, even if there's a Trump appointed judge, but there is a completely arbitrary and erroneous denial, 
you can still challenge it in federal court. So that's what I would advise people. Uh, the additional thought that I have is that um, coming back to this proclamation and the reason behind it, in 2017, uh, Trump's senior advisor at that time, Steve Bannon, said that he was worried about um, too many uh, tech executives of Silicon Valley companies who were immigrants from Asia taking over the helm of these companies. That was a pretty atrocious remark, but you know, over the years, it's not surprising because that's really the thinking of this administration where they where they look at where you come from and your color and to and this whole notion of going back to the old days um, keep america great again could be code for keep america white again and if this ban is uh, aimed against h1b visa holders many of our most successful ceos of google microsoft have come on h1 visas and this has got the kind of you know footprints of the Steve Bannons and his successor Stephen Miller, and that's what's behind this proclamation. It's got nothing to do with economics, nothing to even do with the pandemic. It's just really an excuse for again, I'm going to say the xenophobes in the Trump administration to try to get their last laugh hopefully before they go down in flames in the next election. All right, that was Cyrus Mehta. Thank you very much, Cyrus, for being here. Thank you for your insights. And everyone who's on Twitter, please follow him. We also, he's at Cyrus Mehta. We also showed his website, cyrusmehta.com. Let's go to Prashanti for a final thought. And before that, I'll read you Radhyan's note. Thank you very much, Prashanti, Reddy, Cyrus Mehta, and Sri. Rose and Vandana for tonight's show. Arlene also says thank you. We're very grateful to everyone who watches and, of course, grateful to our guests, including Prashanti Reddy right now. So, yeah, just my final thoughts. I, you know, I'm a little anxious of what will happen if, uh, you know, Trump wins this election. Um, just from what's been happening in the last few years, uh, you know, the last few years and recent, especially the recent past. Um, but... My only hope is the courts, as Cyrus was saying, uh, as long as we have the court system, uh, there is some hope because then uh, Trump will not have the last say and it's it's not, it's thankfully not a dictatorship, it's a democracy. And, you know, there's still the rule of law, you know, and some equity and justice. And so as long as we have the courts, the court system, and as long as people are willing uh, to file lawsuits and are not afraid to do so, uh, I think there is hope. But I'm hoping that um, uh, he doesn't win. Just, I mean, I, I'm, I don't care about Republican or Democratic at this point. It's all politics. All I care about is what is good for immigra immigration at this point, and what is good for the society on the whole. And it's no longer about politics. It's about um, the person who is in power not being the right person, you know, to be president of the United States right now. Uh, and uh, as um, Cyrus was saying, it's it's racism, really. Uh, it's not about what is good for the country. It's really, it's a sham. It's not about the economy, and that's very clear. Uh, anyone who has read even a little bit or looks into the statistics can see that that's not the case. It's not because of the economy. Uh, it's all it is about is is about winning the elections. I don't think even Trump cares about, uh, you know, or has thought about immigration or, or has been for it or against it. He simply thinks that this is a way for him to win the elections because his base is, uh, you know, supports an anti-immigration agenda. And his, un un unfortunately, his closest followers are, you know, support that same agenda as well. See, look below. Look at the person with the Confederate flag, a flag <laughs> of losers, uh, a five-year well, Confederacy yeah, that, you know. that lost the war, that wants monuments to people who lost, who fought against America. These are people who rebelled against America and they want statues, they want flags. They are, you know, this is- You know, it's, I think three common sense should prevail, you know, and what is good for this country should prevail. And, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, America is not going to be a superpower anymore if they ban immigration, because then they will no longer be that source for innovation and uh, won't be there anymore. And it'll be other countries are already taking over 
because of um, you know the present administration's xenophobia and you know intrusiveness. So you know I think um, it's important that we have we have a new administration right now that works. Apollo says thank you all three Rose Vandana Cyrus and. So, so much for this invigorating discussion this evening in the lights of Vegas. And Geeta says, thank you for an informative session. Thank you, both of you. We'll let you go. We still have something that we do here every night. We say their names uh, of the victims of police brutality. We've been doing that every single night, and we will continue to do that. Radian says, without immigrants, we will become a client state for other powers. So let's uh, let's say goodbye to both of you. Thank you very much. We're very grateful. Good luck with everything. I know your phones are very busy. You can find Cyrus on Twitter at Cyrus Mehta. His website is CyrusMehta.com. And you can find Prashanti Reddy on her website, ReadyESQ.com. So please contact them and tell your friends. They were so kind to share their time with us. I'm hoping I don't get a bill from them for their time with us. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. It was great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye uh, to both of you and both, both of you. Thank you very much, folks. Don't leave, please. We want to do what we've done every single day for the last several weeks. Kimberly Crenshaw, the terrific journalist, I'm sorry, professor who coined the term intersectionality, said to me on one of my shows, you must say their names, Sri. And so I'm honoring that by saying their names. We do this every single day. And we say their names through this particular uh, cover story in Time Magazine. On the left is Titus Kaffer's haunting picture uh, painting of a mother and child taken away. And on the right is a photograph of young George Floyd that you may not have seen, where he is being held by his mother, Larsenia. And Larsenia would die two years before, almost to the day that George would be killed. And then they are buried next to each other in Houston. So let us now say their names. This is something sacred that we are able to do on this show. And we wanna say that uh, to this list of names, we uh, often are now pointing to the story of a, a young man who was also uh, killed on the, uh, his brother came onto the show one man's one family story that was Monday in our archives. Just go to youtube.com slash net. Ryan Budu talking about his brother, uh, Ravi Budu, who was killed in police custody at the age of 32. And uh, he told this very poignant story. I, I was in tears listening to it. And I hope all of you will go back and watch episode 103. Today was episode 106. The names are Trayvon Martin, Yvette Smith, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald, Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Jerame Reed, Natasha McKenna, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, William Chapman, Sandra Bland, Darius Scott, Samuel Dubose, Janet Wilson, Kaylin Rockmore, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Joseph Mann, Terence Crutcher, Chad Robertson, Jordan Edwards, Aaron Bailey, Stefan Clark, Danny Ray Thomas, Antoine Rose, Botham Jean, Tatiana Jefferson, Michael Dean, Ahmad Arbery, Brianna Taylor, and George Floyd. And to that list, we must also add Richard Brooks, who was shot and killed in Atlanta just a couple of weeks ago. With that, we bring another episode to a close, we want to thank our sponsors for supporting us. We want to thank our viewers. Thank you so much. If you know anybody who'd like to sponsor the show, we have very inexpensive rates. Just email me, sri at sri.net. You see my email address right here. We'd love to have you as a sponsor. We want to thank the folks at Art & Co., the world's largest online art auction, fundraising for COVID-19 victims, artandco.net, artandco.net. We also want to thank Rutgers Global Entrepreneurship Experience, a virtual team camp. Get 20% off with code SREE, globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org. 20% off for the virtual team camp with SREE. We also want to salute our friends at Muckrack Academy, offering you a free Fundamentals of Social Media course. My team was not free, and that's what Muckrack Academy did. They paid 
for us to bring you a very good course. I'm not saying it, that's what others are saying who've taken the class. It's a free course available right now. 4,000 people have taken it. mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social, open to everybody and you get a certificate at the end of it. And finally, we want to tell you about She's On Call. The next show is this Sunday, June 28th. Please tune in 11 a.m. to noon. We always have fantastic guests. It's hosted by Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar, who's an ENT surgeon, and Dr. Marina Korean, who's a general surgeon here in New York. And they have fabulous guests every week. This Our next show is on Sunday, June 21st. My team at DigiMentors executive producers and produces this show, including Rose Horowitz and Vandana Menon, who produced this show, work on that. And it's a great way to learn. Sundays, 11 to noon. And don't forget my show on every day. We have the show here at around 9 p.m. usually, Eastern time. And then we have a very special New York Times read along on Sunday mornings, 8.30 to 10.30. You can find all these archives on my collection at Srinet. Please subscribe, youtube.com slash Srinet. We've had Nobel Prize winners. We've had doctors. We've had activists, consultants. All of them have been on our shows. Please check out our website or go to youtube.com slash Srinet. That's the easiest way to find all these shows. And look at these numbers, folks. We are so grateful to everyone who has watched. Uh, more than a million people have seen the show in 100 days. We had 201 guests. 124 of them were women, doctors, lawyers, engineers, and CEOs, and nurses, and teachers, and professors. We're very grateful to everyone who's watched and everyone who's commenting. Look at all these comments still coming in. Everyone have a great night, says Radian, but people are, are, are fighting and uh, trolling. Look at this guy. The Atlanta guy attacked a cop. His fault. He did not attack a cop. Please watch the video. See what you would understand. He is a fascist who is here amongst us. This is terrible. No matter what anybody did, nobody deserves to be killed for without any, for the no excuse, of course, but uh, no police officers are allowed to be judge, jury, and executioner on the spot. That is the problem. I'm the son of a police, uh, son-in-law of a police officer. I have friends with police officers, and that's what I say to all of them, and they agree that they are not allowed to do any of this that you're seeing, no matter what the situation and no matter what the guilt and everything else. Go back and watch episode 103. We had the family member here whose brother was killed uh, in police custody, and the brother believes, who's a lawyer now, believes that that was an example of police violence. And uh, lots of smart commentary that Rose is pointing to. Raghav says, uh, thank you, Sri. Everybody, if you watch this, if you enjoyed it, please tell a friend and please tag a friend right now so they can watch this later. We're here every night at 9 p.m. Eastern, sometimes at noon. We recently, episode number 99, Dr. Salmia Swaminathan, the chief scientist of WHO was here, as was the director of pandemics at the WHO. She was here as well, Dr. Sylvie Bryan. Please check out our archives, youtube.com slash Srinet. And the last thing I want to show you is our fun way of keeping up with our show. And that is this. This is a QR code that you can right now uh, point your camera at this and uh, get the QR code. Uh, if you have a QR code reader, you know how to do it. So everybody, please uh, get this. What you'll do is this is not, this is a WhatsApp alert. This is not a racist WhatsApp group. This is just a WhatsApp alert when I am live and so you can get an alert on that. Thank you so much, everybody. We're very grateful to everyone. We'll see you again very soon. Please email me, sri at sri.net, if you have any questions or any comments. Thanks.